Hello and welcome to our service for Sunday the 19th of June 2022. We're nearly at Midsummer's Day and boy does it feel like it. I don't know how it is with you but here in Eastleigh it is absolutely boiling. The UK is having some of its uh, top record temperatures right now. It's over 29 degrees. Now maybe where you are that's not particularly warm but I can tell you in England that is very warm and we're feeling the effects of that even now. But praise God. That sun is shining, and the Son of God is always shining too. Heavenly Father, we praise you because we can come into your house, we can come into your presence, we can come before you as people who just enjoy being with you and need to be with you. So Father, we pray that this time that we spend together now will be wholesome and it will be great and it will be infilling and it will be inspiring in all sorts of ways. In Jesus' name, Amen. Now, our opening song is a classic. These are all classics. And you should be singing along, maybe clapping along, maybe raising your hands with all of them as the service progresses. This particular one is very well loved and it is indeed embedded into our experiences and has been for many a long year now. Lord, the light of your love is shining. Shine, Jesus, shine.
it's beautiful, isn't it? I think that's set you up for the rest of the service, isn't it? What a great song. Now, last month, we brought you an update uh, from the mission organisation, Hope Now, that we support here as a church. And you will know that they work mainly in Ukraine, and for obvious reasons, we concentrated on that last month. But they also work in Sri Lanka, and it's good to have an update of the work that they are doing now, which Karen is going to bring to us. Christian greetings from Farms Ministry. Thank you for the donations you have given for dry ration packs to be distributed around the most needy community in Sri Lanka, as you have done with the Ukraine war victims. We collected rice, dal, sugar and tea leaves, etc., packed them at the office and started distributing to the vulnerable community in churches, church neighbourhoods and with the elderly, the sick and the children. For the last two years, due to the political and the government corruption and failures, Sri Lanka had to borrow a lot of money from foreign countries and the money has not been properly used and the political leaders of the government had used it for their personal use and the Sri Lankan economy has collapsed with no way to pay the debts and it was announced by the authorities as a bankrupt country without foreign reserves. For many months people have suffered by being in queues for long hours, sometimes almost for two days, for cooking gas, kerosene, petrol, diesel and also no availability of milk food. One month ago, a few youth groups started a non-violent peaceful campaign in front of the Presidential Secretariat office in the heart of Colombo to resign as a failure. Little by little, it has increased to thousands, including the Buddhist monks, head of Christian leaders with clergy, Muslims and Hindus with all the communities, although the Sri Lankan government has a two-thirds majority and the, in the parliament and the president has a lot of powers. Recently, another protest started in front of the Prime Minister's official residence, demanding both, both President and Prime Minister and all the Rajapaksa family ministers to go home. Finally, a crash occurred between the supporters of Rajapaksa and the protesters. During this incident, many clergy and people were wounded. Later, a large crowd from the common masses came and supported the protesters and it spread island-wide and almost burnt the residents of Rajapaksa family members and some ministers of the government, and now all are hiding. I'm not sure whether the Prime Minister Mahinda Rajapaksa and his family members left the country secretly. The emergency and curfew was imposed on the 9th of May without an ending date. I was taking the dry rations from the money you have given to us to distribute to outstation families. I left in the morning and on the way I got the news of the emergency and the curfew because of the crashes in Colombo. But I proceeded to the northern province distributing to widows, sick and poor church believers with the permission from the street police verbally and anyhow managed to stay at a guest house in Kilinochi. The next day, because of the emergency and curfew island wide, all shops, trains, buses, petrol sheds and schools remained closed. Some areas were under police protection and some were under the protesters' youth group. I got a permission letter from the Air Force commander of Iranamadu base in the northern province. I came back home last night showing the letter to many places of checkpoints. We managed to get some food where one or two small places were open. In some places, our vehicle was stopped by the rebel groups and searched to see if we were taking politicians as they were searching for them. The highway from Colombo Airport to our area is all free without anybody to look into. We are very sad for our country as we have seen the destruction taking place. Many leaders think this is a curse for the 2019 attack on Christian churches on Easter Sunday while they were praying. We continue our services, although there are a lot of challenges, but trust in God for his protection and providence and the strength given with prayer and financial support from friends like you. We don't have a government at present. As the Prime Minister and the Cabinet have resigned and are in hiding, there is no leadership except the Secretary of Defence and the Army Commander giving some instructions for people to calm down or they will use weapons against the protesters. We regret very much the crimes taking place in Ukraine and the bombing of the places where the Hope Now ministries are taking place and remember them in our prayers daily. Thank you for all the contributions, prayers, encouragement and support given to us. Please uphold us in your prayers as we do you. May God bless you abundantly at this time. 
Yours in his humble servants, Clarence I. Mendis, General Manager, Farm Sri Lanka. Thank you, Karen. We're going to pray for Sri Lanka now. Father, we pray for that land of Sri Lanka. Lord, the wonderful thing about you and your Holy Spirit is you are all over the world. Lord, you are in every nation, in every tribe, in every tongue, in every people group there is. And the good people of Sri Lanka are no different. We pray for them, Father. We pray that you will restore good government to them. Lord, we pray for them that their economy will grow. We know that's a problem all over the world at the moment, but specifically at the minute we're praying for Sri Lanka and we pray in Jesus' name that you will create something of an economic miracle in that place. We pray for the church there, Lord. We pray because it is in places persecuted, Lord, and we, we pray against persecution. Obviously we do, not just of the church, but of any group of people. But we ask you, Father God, to strengthen your people there, Lord, to strengthen their leaders, to give them resilience and resolve to see the race run to the end. And Father, we pray in general that you will bless that nation, bless that land, and restore it to a good place in you. In Jesus' name. Amen. Now we come to a classic hymn. Third Sunday in the month, we have hymns, and there's no better hymn, well, in my view anyway, than this one. It encourages us to praise my soul, the King of heaven, to his feet thy tribute bring. And we will. the basis of worship isn't it to his feet bringing our tributes to him we're going to read now from the word of God this is Psalm 122 I rejoice with those who said to me let us go to the house of the Lord 
Our feet are standing in your gates, Jerusalem. Jerusalem is built like a city that is closely compacted together. That is where the tribes go up, the tribes of the Lord, to praise the name of the Lord according to the statute given to Israel. There stand the thrones of judgment, the thrones of the house of David. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. May those who love you be secure. May there be peace within your walls and security within your citadels. For the sake of my family and friends, I will say, peace be within you. For the sake of the house of the Lord our God, I will seek your prosperity. Beautiful. So as we come towards the message, we want to talk about the power of God working in our places of worship. So what better song could there be for us than to sing, Be Still, for the presence of the Lord is moving in this place. Lovely. 
I hope you were singing along with that. I'm sure you were. You can't resist it, can you? Now, over the last couple of weeks, you may have thought I was giving being inside the house of God a little bit of a hard time whilst I was talking about the Holy Spirit kicking the disciples out of the room that they were in in the temple courts on the day of Pentecost so that they could preach the gospel to the people around on the outside. Now, to be honest, I'm actually a big fan of people coming into the house of God as well. Whilst I genuinely don't think the church should be confined into its buildings and restrained by its walls, I do think we should be using these buildings as a resource for the communities that we serve on God's behalf. To use our building here as an example, whilst Emmanuel is growing, it's still very much a small church, but even here, our building is very widely used. We have a preschool that uses it every day of the week. We have our Sunshine Corner Breakfast Club that we have people coming into. There is our Ladies Bible Study and Fellowship Group. There is our Sunday services, as you will know. We also have ad hoc services in here from time to time, weddings and funerals and baby dedications. And this building is used for national and local elections too. The people of the community know where this place is and they're not afraid to walk through the door. At least that's part of our prayer for this place. Christians and people who are not yet Christians of all ages come to this place and they eat together and they drink together, they talk together, they listen to each other. They laugh together, they cry together. And that's the kind of thing that our church buildings should be being used for. This building was opened as a mission hall in 1905 and it has been a mission hall for the whole of its 117 year existence. The mission is no different now to what it was back then at the start of the 20th century. And of course this is the only church building on our street corner. Now that's not to give it an exclusivity. I'm not saying that to build up our church because you've only got to go down the road to the next corner and you'll find the Anglican church there also serving God in its very special and unique way. Go for the rest of the town. There are other churches that are doing exactly the same thing, using their buildings for the blessing of the community and to the glory of God. Churches come in all shapes and sizes and actually they meet in all sorts of places. They have their own range of activities and I praise God for every single one of them. Every church is unique and I think that is magnificent too. I am saying this because God's people gathering in the house of God is still very much a biblical imperative even if our ministry should also spill over into the streets and in these days onto people's devices. We can see that from the first couple of verses of Psalm 122. Here's verse 1 again. I rejoiced with those who said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. To David, the house of the Lord was an exciting place of rejoicing. He went there with others who were also rejoicing. That said, I can't help asking myself, where did they go? Where was this house of God? The temple hadn't been built and wouldn't be until David's son Solomon was on the throne. So were they worshipping at the tabernacle or were they just talking about something else? We have a clue to that in verse 2. Our feet are standing in your gates, Jerusalem. Now that may indicate that he was talking about the tabernacle which was up on Mount Zion where the temple would eventually be built, but it also may indicate that they were just talking about the city of Jerusalem, considering that to be the house of God. Mixing the two is a great thought. We can and should rejoice when we go up to the actual house of God, ready and waiting for him to do great things in us, through us and for us. And we could and should rejoice when we go into the streets, to our workplaces, to our homes, ready and waiting for him to do great things in us, through us and for us in exactly the same way. The house and the street are not mutually exclusive. The presence of God, because the Holy Spirit has been given to us, is always with us. In the house of God, in the streets, in the homes, in our leisure facilities and on our phones. Beautiful. But here today I really want to concentrate for a while on the importance and benefits of physically meeting together. 
For clarity's sake, I will refer to where we meet as the house of God, not the church, because that's the believers. And I may shorten that house of God thing down to just the house, in case you wonder what I'm talking about there. In reality, churches meet in all sorts of buildings, from cathedrals to coffee shops, from school halls to members' homes, as well as church buildings, of course. For us today, they are all the house of God. Now, did you notice that David rejoiced with those who said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord? There are a couple of things here that we need to take note of. First, we can obviously see that for David on this occasion, worship was a shared experience. Now, it wasn't always the case. If you look at Psalm 121, just the psalm before, you'll find David was going through a very solitary time there. But here in this psalm, there was a joy, there was an excitement to attending the house of God with other people, and that's exactly how it should be. It also gives rise to the idea that the house of God should be a place of rejoicing and rejoicing together. It's okay for our churches to be loud and vibrant. Actually, it's okay for our churches to be quiet and contemplative too. What it's not okay for is our churches to be stagnant and, dare I say, boring. It is important that we are forward-looking, that we have a vision, and that we reach out together rejoicing and praising God and preaching his word. Churches should be attractive places to come to and relevant to the people in our communities. Rejoicing is always meant to be a big part of church life. The Apostle Paul said to the Philippians in chapter 4, verse 4, Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again. Rejoice! Beautiful. Now if you were to flip backwards in your Bibles to Psalm 84, you will see that the psalmist David can't wait to be where the presence of God is, to worship God in his house. So he waxes lyrical about the blessedness of those who frequently go to the house of God of God. Whilst I for one am grateful that churches can and do now post their services online, that's the work of the Holy Spirit, 21st century style, coming to the house of God should be the sole yearn of every believer. I wouldn't want to be legalistic about it, but I would say it should be a priority for believers rather than something which we just do when we've got nothing better to do at that moment in time to come together, to worship, and to share the blessings that God has in store for us. If we were to take verses 1, 2, and 4 of Psalm 84, we would read this. How lovely is your dwelling place, Lord Almighty. My soul yearns, even faints for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh cry out for the living God. Blessed are those who dwell in your house. They are ever praising you. It's obvious from those verses that David knew that going to the house of God was good for him. And going to the house of God with other people was good for him too. A vital part of his experience. By the way, it would be easy to think that ministers like me keep badgering people to come to the house of God because we benefit from it. That's true. We do. But whilst maybe sometimes people are thinking it's to increase our numbers or to perhaps swell our coffers, it really isn't. For every good minister out there, the important thing about people coming to the house of God where, that they lead is because you encourage us as much as I hope that we encourage you. You bless us as much as I hope we bless you. So yes, we do need you in the house of God with us. There is no better reason for coming into the house of God than in response to his invitation, though not the invitation of the ministers and leaders. Deuteronomy chapter 12, verse 5 says this, But you are to seek the place the Lord your God will choose from among all your tribes to put his name there for his dwelling. To that place you must go. The house of God is an awesome place. But because it is where God has chosen to interact with his people, not just because it is the house of God. God has chosen to be there. The presence of God there makes it special, makes it holy, makes it blessed. 
It is the place where God is revered and revealed to those who worship him and open his word. Moses wrote Deuteronomy, of course, and he knew the benefits of being in the house of God as much as King David did. David talked about rejoicing, didn't he? On his way to the house of God with others who were rejoicing. And a couple of verses later in Deuteronomy 12, in verse 7, Moses says there, in the presence of the Lord your God, you and your families shall eat and shall rejoice because the Lord your God has blessed you. Now, doesn't that really describe what we do in churches? We eat together and we rejoice in the house of God. Wonderful thing, isn't it? Ah, but I hear you say that there in the Psalms and in Deuteronomy, that's Old Testament. Maybe it wasn't so important in the New Testament when the Holy Spirit had been poured out upon them and they could go anywhere and everywhere and still be in the presence of God. Now, it's true that the landscape did change a bit in the transition from Old to New, especially after the church was dispersed from Jerusalem and the temple was out of reach for many of them but that's all to the early church meeting each other in the house was still important be that in the temple if they were still in Jerusalem or in each other's homes Acts 5 42 day after day in the temple courts and from house to house they never stopped teaching and proclaiming the good news that Jesus is the Messiah the presence of God was no less powerful in either place in Acts 3 we have Peter and John healing the blind man at the temple and telling him to leap and dance for joy in Acts 10 in Cornelius's house the Holy Spirit filled the first Gentiles and they spoke in tongues and they prophesied and the church grew through those shared experiences that they had always being one to encourage us the writer of Hebrews encourages us since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us not give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. That literally means don't neglect meeting together, please. The writer to Hebrews didn't say it simply because it was a duty. He said it, in light of the sacrifice of Jesus and the fact that, as we have mentioned so many times in recent weeks, the Lord our God is coming again. The second coming may just be round the corner. And we need to do this all the more as we see that day approaching. But crucially, and you'll have noticed this from those verses, it is about encouraging one another. Coming to the house of God recognises our individual roles in making the house of God a place of encouragement, a place to be at each other's side, a place to sit and listen to others, a place to encourage them, a place to talk to them, a place to raise them up. It's not just about coming and singing or listening to the message preached by the leader. It's about being church together and encouraging one another so that we grow together. Heavenly Father, I praise you for every truth of your word and your word is full of truth. Lord, these words that I've spoken today, Lord, may be the words of a preacher, but the heart of God is in them because it is your word, Lord. And, and I pray we will examine ourselves and make sure, Lord God, that we spend as much time in the house of God as we practically can to encourage one another and to grow. In Jesus' precious name, Amen. Now we're going to end our service on a great note of victory. Again, this is another song that you will know so well from your experience in church if you've been around for quite a number of years. It absolutely rocks my heart every time we sing it. I want to shout to the Lord. Why? Because I want my Jesus, my Saviour, to be recognised.
So that's it, what a great way of finishing our service today. Now I normally give you a benediction, and I will this week too. But I'm going to take this one from the end of Psalm 122 that we read earlier. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. May those who love you be secure. May there be peace within your walls, and security within your citadels. For the sake of my family and friends, I will say, peace be within you. For the sake of the house of the Lord our God, I will seek your spiritual prosperity. Take care of yourselves. See you in seven days.